So, yeah, so I'm going to I'm going to present some of the results of my thesis research here at the Simon Seminar. Um, it's under the sets or the socio-ecological um, entanglements in tropical societies project, which is a, which is a project uh, at the anthropology department here, and it allowed me to go visit go visit some interesting places here this summer. So, but first, uh, before I present some of my research, uh, I would like to preface my presentation by asking you a question. Did you know you can lose up to 10 liters of water a day while hiking in tropical climates? I certainly learned this firsthand during my fieldwork this summer with Trent Set's project, Excursion to Archaeological Park in Cambodia. But despite, but despite the greater physiological need for water in tropical ecological zones, the unpredictability of water resources due to variables like precipitation, humidity, ambient heat, or geomorphology, which is the shape of landscape forms, meant that human populations in the tropics both past and present, had to track down water resources seasonally to survive. Or they had to attempt to either predict and physically manipulate the surrounding landscape to avoid the potential health consequences associated with the lack of water. So the tropics have long been cast as marginal environments, variable water quantity, along with high ambient temperatures, a greater burden of insect pests and parasites, and high plant respiration, which affects the number of crops that can be planted together were all thought to be major ecological barriers to both industrial and urban development in the tropics, which largely house the countries of the global south. Up until the last 20 years or so, however, the tropics were thought, um, the tropics were thought to be difficult to develop without outside technological intervention, such as through European colonial occupation or through the international aid programs of the post-World War II period. But as increasingly, what is increasingly apparent, however, through both anthropological and archaeological, archaeological investigation, as well as a greater appreciation of indigenous knowledge systems, is that societies in the tropics, both past and present, have a long tradi tradition of different techniques and technologies that not only allowed human populations to thrive in, the, in these environmental circumstances, but also allowed them to create some of the most impressive kingdoms and empires of the pre-industrial past. So these um, kingdoms and empires or early complex societies of the tropics and subtropics, frequently modified, expanded, and refined wetland environments, such as lake and river floodplains, marsh and swamps, mangrove forests and estuaries into complex agrosystems, cultivated ecosystems, or artificial landscapes that utilized a variety of landscaping and water control techniques to supply water during times of scarcity. And um, just as an example here, uh, this is, these, were, these two pictures were taken on the same day, so you can sort of see the level of precipitation there. We were, uh, we were traveling through a particular temple at that time, and we got, we got absolutely flooded. We had to like, um, we had to like, I felt like one of those like, it was bad. It was really bad. <laughs> it was so bad. We were like up to our knees in uh, water. It was, it was awful. We had to like climb through a window to get out. So, I think an actual temple window, which was bad. So. Just, just as an idea of like the levels of precipitation you can get in just one day. But um, so despite these sort of circumstances, uh, these uh, societies in the tropics were able to use water um, techniques to control water. Um, these included the lowland Maya of South and South, uh, South America, the Charter States of South and Southeast Asia, and though not under the preview of the SETS project, the complex hunter-gatherer societies of the Amazon. So what the Sets project focuses on are the charter states. The charter states um, were early complex state-level societies in South and Southeast Asia, and they're called the charter states because they acted as templates for the political, social, and economic organization of the succeeding states that came after them. Um, and these, these states all kind of collapsed around the 14th to 15th century CE. And you can see that there's a, that sort of big collection in, in there. Right, right where the, like, um, yeah, right in South and Southeast Asia. So, so, but the Charter State successfully adopted a specific water and land use strategy called um, Low Density Dispersed Agrarian Urbanism to adapt their cities to the environmental challenges of life in the tropics, such as the variable, uh, variable water availability and quantity, as dictated by the rhythms of the annual monsoon rains. This has resulted in a distinct urban footprint or city plan for early complex societies in Southeast Asia, but generally can be characterized by a dispersed or spread out settlement pattern, or like housing organization, 
of spread out residential areas, a concentrated core of temples and other administrative bodies that sort of ran everything from the middle, and spread out from that sort of large-scale localized water management systems, so like reservoirs and canals that were all spread throughout the landscape, and along those were like open green spaces of uh, localized, uh, localized and large-scale agricultural systems, which often tended to be rice, but there were polycultural systems, so uh, they, were, they were also planting like garden and other horticultural species all around, sort of big open green area spaces, and the main sort of backbone of these urban of these urban spaces were cooperative networks of agricultural laborers who made up 80% of the population. So, in the emerging conversation surrounding pre-industrial Southeast Asia's urban archaeology, one, one other study topic I explored with my thesis research is the health advantages and repercussions of dispersal density query in urbanism. The greater physiological need for water in the tropics also exposes people to a higher risk of contracting infectious diseases that are either spread by contaminated water or exposure to insect vectors and species and parasites that breed, and re that breed and reside in water sources. And as a member of the SETS project, our goal is to understand the resiliency and adaptability of these past state-level societies' relationships to their tropical environments. Unfortunately, the study of settlements and urban planning for these major cities in Southeast Asia is still in process uh, due to varying levels of preservation. You know, things like floods that kind of wash everything away. There's all, it's all, some of the soils are also kind of highly acidic, which gets rid of a lot of organic material, which, um, and since a lot of these houses were made out of like bamboo and reed and things like that, it doesn't, it doesn't stay in the archaeological record. And there's of course like recent political unrest that made some of these countries very inaccessible in the recent past. So archaeologists are just starting to understand the urban development or the planning and building process behind the charter states, the major cities. And the main exception to that is the capital city of the Khmer Empire, which is known as Angkor. We have a very nice archaeological map here that was just developed a couple years ago. Um, have you ever seen the first Tomb Raider movie starring Angelina Jolie? You may have seen Angkor's temples in the movie's backdrop, and that used to be its major claim to fame. But uh, now Angkor is famous for another reason. We said remote sensing projects, pedestrian survey, and excavations at the state's main capital have given us a thorough understanding of the stages behind this particular city's development between the 8th and 15th century CE. And now Angkor is considered to be the largest low density dispersed city in antiquity, which makes it a really big place and really hard to understand uh, until, until now at least. But spread over 1,000 square kilometers, Angkor's large scale water management system of reservoirs and canals transformed its surrounding wetland landscape to store annual monsoon rains for rice production, enough to supply an estimated 750,000 people at its largest extent. So it makes it comparable to some modern day cities, right? And we normally don't think about that in the past. And this is despite the yearly droughts that are typical for this climate zone. And using Angkor as my main case study, I sought to answer the city planning practice of dispersed low density agrarian urbanism, promote resilience against the health hazards and risks associated with tropical wetland environments. But in order to answer these questions, I also had to know where tropical disease hazards were also likely to have been present in mainland Southeast Asia during the Charter era, or between the 8th and 15th century CE. What strategies would the inhabitants of Angkor have used to prevent the risk of contracting these diseases? And how did these patterns of disease risk and vulnerability change over time with the transformation of Angkor's urban footprint or city plan? <coughs> so, the SETS project specifically uses two theories to frame our analysis of these human environment interactions, resilience theory and entanglement theory. So resilience theory is an, adop is an adoption of an ecological concept which is adapt, examines the adaptability and sustainability of human environmental interactions over the long term. While entanglement theory is largely a, a postmodern archaeological theory, so it's, it's coming from us for once, which is kind of nice. Normally, we tend to archaeologists tend to borrow concepts and theories from other areas of the science. We're kind of like a jack of all trades. Um, and this theory sort of identifies those human environment interrelations as material entities, which we can observe and identify and dig up from the ground, and make some sort of conclusions based off of that. So what do resilience theory and entanglement theory have to do with understanding the vulnerability of a human population to disease hazards and risks? The land and water use strategies used by humans who initially solve environmental problems can result in a risk spiral, spiral characterized by dependency on these same problems savings as time progresses. And this can result in a disaster if they, are unsuitable for if they become unsuitable for changing circumstances, which can be both societal and environmental. 
For example, both the populations of the Lolan Maya and the Charter States maintain water quantity by constructing artificial reservoirs in times of water scarcity, as well as water quality by selecting certain aquatic plants, like the lotus over there, and also uh, water lilies in, in the case of the South American case studies, to transform artificial reservoirs into constructed wetland biospheres, which would regulate the populations of organisms that were within these reservoirs, and as well as using frequent dredging of siltation and waste, fish cultivation from insect removal, and sand filtering systems, which kept the moats surrounding important temple institutions um, clean, clean and free of, of contamination. Um, in regards to domestic goings, it is thought that cultural taboos surrounding frequent washing and relatively, the relatively dispersed going pattern under the spread of direct contact or human-to-human -human diseases, the traditional residential structure of an elevated house on stilts, which you can see there um, from one of my own personal photos, or a mound is thought to have kept families away from the seasonal floodwaters, allowed for quicker race removal through a hole in the floor. But I wanted to know, were these practices always sustainable and suitable over time? I wanted to investigate the desire to solve smaller and more immediate problems of infectious diseases in Angkor had more difficult to maintain with consequences. If the material entanglement of human and environmental interrelationships is not adaptable or flexible enough. So my largest challenge with my research project is that we really don't know what specific diseases were based by Angkor's population. With the adoption of Hinduism and Buddhism in the mainland of the late Iron Age, so between 500 BCE and 500 CE, Changes in mortuary practices involving cremation and exposure, which is a practice involving leaving bodies outside to be exposed to the elements, rather than burial, meant that skeletal samples are not available for these charter state sites. And skeletons are normally the direct data source used by archaeologists to assess population health of the past. Thus, I had to use indirect, pre-existing data sets to identify the potential health hazards that Angkor's population would have faced. And these included medical literature on the evolutionary trail of infectious diseases in Southeast Asia, based on genetic studies and histories of population movements, physical evidence of these diseases in the form of both historical references and osteological or skeletal material um, from other sites that place these diseases presence directly or either indirectly in pre-industrial Southeast Asia before or after the establishment of Angkor, and finally the archaeological evidence of human behaviors that would modify the environment to create environmental niches for certain tropical diseases as observed from on-site visitations to Angkor. So I made a big literature review all about that. Um, uh, so, then I, so then I was able to identify the tropical diseases that were likely to be present in Angkor throughout its existence. And these included diseases that were thought to develop independently in Southeast Asia during the Paleolithic and Neolithic, such as Vivax malaria and dengue fever, which are both spread by mosquitoes, which are not cool. Um, diseases that are spread with the development of rice agriculture in the region, such as schistosomiasis and beriberi and meliodosis. Uh, diseases that are associated with the control and collection of water, such as typhoid. Diseases that are associated with the development of sedentary village life, such as yaws, syphilis, leprosy, and tuberculosis. And diseases that were brought to the region through, the, through trade in the Iron Age, such as smallpox and cholera. So what do these suspect diseases all have in common? Their pathogens, or disease-bearing agents, which are often parasitic microorganisms, thrive and spread from host to host in conditions of overcrowdedness and inadequate sanitation. Now, knowing what disease risks were likely faced by Angkor's population, I thus examined the building stages of water management, infrastructure, and residential patterns, or housing placement in Angkor, to identify the periods of time in the areas where the inhabitants' exposure to these diseases' risk factors would have been the greatest. This involved me reconstructing the development of Angkor as a city over time, based off of sources like excavation reports, survey maps, paleoecological, or past environmental and climate reconstructions, and also historical texts. So the development of Angkor as a city over time and space generally falls into these three sort of main stages. So between the 8th and 10th century CE, Angkor's main urban settlement pattern was comprised of a network of temple cities, um, with residential uh, features spreading out from a temple precinct in an unstructured manner, and the irregular distribution of house, of house mounds and residential ponds. So it's all sort of very loose and not very organized at all. And then in between the 9th and 11th century CE, we saw the settlement plan seeing an increasing integrated urbanization with linear features like roads and canals introduced to organized space with regularly distributed house mounds, ponds, and other water management features ordered into a grid pattern. And finally, in the 11th and 12th century CE, walls were introduced to divide the civic ceremonial core, so the big concentration of temples, 
away from the rest of the urban complex, with large concentrations of non-agricultural specialists living in not closely spaced together residential zones near the temples. So these would be your scribes, um, your, your artisans, so people who weren't like um, people who weren't agricultural laborers. And so during this period, the largest temple complexes, Angkor Wat and Angkor Thom, were built. And in this way, the last stage of Angkor's urban development plan saw it develop, resemble the more compact, bounded, or walled cities that are normally associated with pre-industrial cities in non-tropical areas. So what happened? Um, this, this was not to last. A startling change in climate had also emerged in the late 14th and 15th century CE with the end of the medieval climate anomaly, which was a period of warm, stable climate with more stable, predictable monsoons. And this transitioned into the Little Ice Age, which was a colder, drier period. And the Little Ice Age saw intense monsoons followed by a protracted series of droughts to the point where the hydraulic infrastructure or the water management network at Angkor wasn't able to keep up. And, uh, I tried to be artistic with that there, just sort of, never mind, but that's okay. <laughs> um, to sort of show the subsuming of that. But, um, so, but it's largely agreed that these erratic climate changes would have likely damaged the hydraulic infrastructure that Angkor's rice-based economy was so heavily reliant upon, forcing the population to abandon the city and return to a more decentralized village lifestyle. And what, can we think, and what, and what was likely due to this? Well, reduced size and availability of water bodies causes crowding of both reservoir species, which are animal populations that act as sources of diseases, like in the case of tuberculosis, um, and consequently leads to increased pathogen load in water through, well, animals, well, you know, <laughs> I don't, eh, never mind. <laughs> um, furthermore, the search for more water leads to more contact between humans and humans, and greater opportunities for disease transmission as they search for water resources in the same place. Um, pathogen, pathogen transmission can also be higher when the water levels are low. And as with flooding of important wetlands and water sources, the drying of wetlands during drought can also cause the forced displacement of human populations, and such environments provide favorable conditions for the proliferation and transmission of pathogens. And as I argue here, such favorable conditions would have been also at present at Angkor during the last stages of its development. The intense series of droughts and floods associated with the end of the medieval climate anomaly reduced the regular amount of water available to Angkor's populace. This sort of created a greater platform for the infectious thesis that I found, and the search for more wetland resources for potable water or drinkable water created more disease transmission routes, either through the sharing of fewer and fewer water resources as the climate became colder and drier, which led to their contamination, increased contact between people, creating more incidences of direct contact diseases or human diseases that are transmitted to each other, as they shared reduced water resources, and these conditions also reduced the effectiveness of the constructed wetland biospheres and temple moats and reservoirs and canals, which normally regulated the populations of organisms that would spread disease. So, this first low density urban plan of Angkor was at its core a land use strategy developed over the long term, centuries at least, to meet the challenges of the tropical environment, especially in regards to the dynamics of the yearly monsoon. It was only until the last stages of Angkor's urban development that the concentration of the population, away from a dispersed settlement pattern, may have increased the inhabitants' vulnerability to the risks of infectious disease, as the city took on a more compact urban character that was not as incompatible as the early dispersed pattern for dealing with the disease dynamics of the surrounding wetland environment. So what are the significance of these findings? The need for fresh and contaminated water is a foremost concern for all human societies, for hydration, subsistence, hygiene, as well as the resources supplied by wetland environments for buffering the effects of droughts, floods, and regulating the populations of organisms that are spread by, that spread diseases. And not having access to water resources consequently is a major environmental hazard or challenge for human health and well-being. But it can turn into a disaster if human responses to those challenges are unsuitable. With rising global temperatures far more reaching than the climate change of the past, studying how humans adapt to the past climate crises, like at Angkor, can help us understand the consequences of similar disasters in the future, especially as our own impact on the Earth ecosystem becomes less and less predictable. And that's it. Um, finally, I'd like to thank everyone for making this research project possible. You said something a couple of times about how having those water resources helps to uh, limit the population of pathogens spreading the animals. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, in the case of mosquitoes, um, 
very bi dirt, bio, biodiverse um, water bodies. They tend to have populations of other insects that will regulate mosquito populations by acting as predators or, um, or acting as competitors for those mosquito species. So healthy wetlands will regularly, if they're not degraded by human, like, um, like, like human activities, uh, will like keep populations low and it's normally like it's human activities that sometimes can like allow mosquito populations to proliferate because they because the mosquito populations tend to I guess um, I guess in more anthropogenic wetland environments that uh, humans have to, I guess degraded they they tend to have a better chance of living there and that can end up causing mosquitoes spreading disease all over the place I guess yeah so 